on this week in Enterprise Tech. Brian Curtis and I talk about how Equifax weaseled their way back in the news and how their breach could have been prevented. Marriott seems to have been hit by hackers from China. And we talk with a great guest, Tracy Reinhold, Chief Security Officer for Emberbridge, about orchestrating an organized response to all events. Twyla, on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyla This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 320, recorded December 13th, 2018, airing December 14th, 2018. Everbridge and Alert Management. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by JW Player, helping businesses, including twit.tv, to make money on their video. To make more while saving 50% off your platinum subscription, visit jwplayer.com slash twit and use code twit at checkout. And by Avnet. Avnet and Not Impossible Labs created a historic event at the Life is Beautiful Music Festival, a first of its kind live concert that helped the deaf and hearing communities experience music in a whole new way. Visit avnet.com slash music one to see the journey. And by DigitalOcean, the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications. Over 150,000 businesses rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash twit. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that's dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreski, your guide to this big world of the enterprise but I definitely cannot guide you by myself. I need some help from some of the top enterprise tech professionals in the industry, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin, senior editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to be here, Lou. It's uh, winter in South Florida, which means that we're all happy. And um, the criminals just keep on doing their things, so which means that we're happy at Dark Reading. In this, with all that, it's good to be here on Twyat. Without those criminals, we wouldn't be, keep getting our security news. So hopefully they, they keep up that work. But folks, of course, we have not one but two enterprise tech professionals. And this is Mr. Brian Chi, Director of Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. Cheeber, welcome back to the show. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Um, I'm actually playing with some Axis camera station appliances and setting up some new surveillance cameras. And the cool thing is they integrate really nicely in for my Department of Public Safety. Fantastic. Well, thanks, guys, for being here. Well, we have a bunch of security news this past week, and our episode tries to focus on all of that. But we also have – we're going to talk a little bit about how Equifax seemed to have weaseled their way back into the news, but not in a good way. Plus, we have a great guest from Everbridge to talk about handling those events and issues by assessing and orchestrating a response. But before we get there – Hackers wait for no one, and even during this holiday season. So let's go ahead and jump into the blips. Now, we have quite the show centered around security and response today, but we always seem to have data breaches to talk about, too. Now, we can't forget the one, that latest data breach that happened from this past from November, where Marriott was the latest contender in poor security practices with leaking the data of 500 million of its guests. The data taken was that of credit cards, password numbers, and over four years of data from guests who stated hotels previously operated by Starward. According to the set of investigators, they suspect that hackers were working on behalf of the Chinese Ministry and State Security. Now, according to Assistant Director of FBI Counterintelligence Division, China's espionage efforts have become the most severe counterintelligence threat facing our country today. Now, based on the data from, the, some, from a cybersecurity expert at University of Maryland, due to the duration of the hack and the type of data taken, it's most likely used to track people, making it more likely that it's state actors who initiated it. Now, this comes in the midst of the CEO from Huawei being arrested on the American warrant because of a possible trade agreement with Iran. There have been definitely, definitely tensions brewing and brings up other topics of whether organizations will be able to keep up with the widespread campaigns of hackers today. Could it be a lack of awareness, possibly a lack of end-to-end -end understanding of information systems implemented? If one thing is clear, make it your New Year's resolution to start auditing what's being done in your organizations because moving forward, 
You'll be just have to need to understand that you m- m- must most likely have to assume breach. Well, you knew this day would eventually arrive. Mac-based malware appeared on WatchGuard's top 10 list of the most common types of malware for the first time in their third quarter of 2018 list. The Mac malware, which came in sixth on the list, is primarily delivered via email and tries to trick victims into installing fake cleaning software. The latest Latest internet security report, which analyzed the 100,000 most visited websites on Alexa.com, also found that 6.8% of those sites still support insecure versions of the SSL encryption protocol. The researchers note that hackers look for where they can get the most ROI, and for several years that was with Windows machines. But over the last five years, Mac laptops have become very popular, which is why they believe there's been a surge in Mac malware. Now, when it comes to the websites, researchers recommend that organizations running websites with sensitive information use TLS 1.2 or 1.3. And for those that don't carry or collect sensitive information, the researchers say that unencrypted is the way to go because it doesn't promise users a level of security that might not exist and certainly doesn't matter. Well, we just found a pub where your cash is, cash is worthless. So cashless establishments may be safer and more convenient, but are they more popular with the public at large? After yet another break-in at a South London pub, the Crown and Anchor, Arbor Rosha Rose decided enough was enough. Burglars were after cash lying around after lockup, but what if there was never any cash on site at all? Mr. Roja, operations director at the pub's parent firm, London Village Inns, calculated the volume of cash transactions and was below, bowled over. Somewhere in the region, region of 10 to 13 percent of the total revenue would be cash and the rest was cards. So this last October, the crown and anchor went cashless. Customers can use debit cards, credit cards and contactless payments, including Android Pay and Apple Pay. But a five rule gets you nowhere. I personally have gotten to the point where I carry as little cash as possible now and prefer to have the audit trail of my cards. Now, if only U.S. cards would have a pin to go with that chip and make them a little bit safer, perhaps we could all rest easier going cashless. I have a little bit of hardware news here. Now, my roots are in electrical engineering, so whenever I hear about the next generation of powerful computing, I get a little bit giddy. Now, this time it's GPUs, and Intel is going to make it less expensive for you to get a good one that's packaged up with your CPU. Now, Intel's latest promise is that the next generation of CPUs will have a huge improvement to the performance of its integrated GPUs. Its Generation 11 or Gen 11 GPU will be more than double the execution units from 24 to 64, which will boost the number of crunching, number crunching performance to more than 1 trillion floating point operations per second. A bit of data on that is the new generation Gen 11 is arranged into blocks combining execution units with dedicated 3D hardware such as texture samplers. Now with 16 execution units, Gen 11 will should be achieving be able to achieve 1 teraflops of performance. Now similar to the Mali G- GPUs designed by ARM, the new GPU will actually use a tile-based rendering approach which divides the images into tiles that are all rendered separately. This tends to reduce the amount of memory bandwidth that the GPU needs, which is valuable in integrated GPUs, and as they lack the high-performance memory found in those discrete parts that you buy. Now, in addition to all those tech goodness, Intel also has redesigned its H.264 encoder from the ground up, now supporting 4K and up to 8K streaming with HDR and also adaptive sync technology. Now, the 10 nanometer processors will be available in early 2019, so it might just be your chance to hold off on that big workstation purchase this year to get an even better savings in the new year. Well, a new exploit kit is targeting home and small business routers, and its target is banking information. Soho and small business routers are a growing target for hackers. Latest example is Novadad, a dangerous new exploit kit that multiple attack groups appear to be using to target routers belonging to millions of users in Brazil and, to a lesser extent, other parts of the world. The malware changes DNS settings on routers, so all traffic through them is hijacked and routed to a malicious server. 
When users of Novodot-infected routers attempt to access certain target banks, for instance, their traffic is redirected to cloned versions of the login pages of the bank they're trying to access. Now, most of the attacks have involved attempts to retrieve banking credentials from Internet users in Brazil, but some of the Novodot campaigns have involved targets in no specific geographic location, suggesting either that the attackers are expanding their efforts or that a large group of actors are using the kit. Researchers at Trend Micro, who've been tracking the campaign, say that routers under attack include models from D-Link, MediaBridge, Motorola, and TP-Link. The best way for users to mitigate their exposure to threats like Novodot is to ensure their routers have the latest firmware version and are properly patched. Users should, of course, also change default usernames and passwords, change the router's default IP address, and disable remote access features. So... It may not be too late to reinstate the Obama era net neutrality rules through a legislative loophole that allows lawmakers to undo federal regulation. Monday was supposed to be the deadline for the U.S. House of Representatives to gather enough signatures to force a vote on a Congressional Review Act petition that would roll back the FCC's repeal of the popular 2015 rules. The CRA gives the House and Senate set periods of time to undo recently enacted federal regulations. The Senate passed its CRA resolution in May. The House has until the end of the year to pass its resolution. Then it must be signed by President Donald Trump to take effect, which many believe is unlikely since Trump's penchant for reducing federal regulation. Due to the rules in the House about when such petitions can be filed and because many had expected the 2018 Congress to end its session in early December, many believe that today, December 10th, well, a couple days ago, would be the deadline for the House CRA to get a vote. So I say to the lobbyists complaining about the states and territories looking at implementing their own more stringent net brutality laws that perhaps you should talk to your Congress critters and tell them, oops, I was wrong, and please put back the less restrictive Obama-era rules. Now, for those hacker movie fans out there, that super tanker malware Leonardo da Vinci wasn't that far-fetched. For its time. Now, according to a new report by the international shipping industry titled Guidelines on Cybersecurity on Board Ships, there have been many numerous past cybersecurity incidents on large tankers showing that IT systems on these vessels are a direct target. Now, in one example, it actually walks through the case of a mysterious virus infecting the electronic chart display and information systems that ships use for sailing. Now, this wasn't the only incident, though. Ships were also impacted by ransomware, sometimes directly. On other incidents, the ransomware hit backend systems and servers used by ships already on their voyage at sea. Now, in other incidents, Detail in the report, a ship owner actually reported not one but two ransomware infections, both occurring due to partners and not necessarily because of the ship's crew. In addition, there was another ransomware infection due to failing to set up proper RDP passwords. Now, remotely accessed accounts and systems weren't the only reason or sources of infections on the ships. The report also talks about the severity of using USB thumb drives usually needed to update systems or transfer new documents into air-gapped networks. Now, mostly... So uh, all the ship's uh, integrated navigation bridge systems have suffered failures of nearly all navigation systems at sea in high traffic areas and it has reduced their visibility. Now, these types of failures not only cause distraction, but they could be down for a long enough time to cause navigational issues as well. Uh, in addition to the report, the document outlines numerous new guidelines for these vessels. Now, these are guidelines. They're meant for securing IT systems located on the ship, but they're supposed to work with Similar security controls deployed in ports and ships companies own inter internal IT network. Unfortunately, they are guidelines. Organizations can choose to ignore them. I, I have a feeling this trend will continue to uh, start happening uh, until something catastrophic happens in the future. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But first, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And that's JW Player. Now, everyone watches videos online. And when, when it works well, you really don't know or even notice what player it is that you're, you're watching the video on. But if you look closer, you'll notice that it's most likely JW Player. Now, I have a, I've built a ton of friends in my day. And I can tell you that JW Player is one of the most flexible and feature-rich HTML5 video platforms out there today. It's easy to integrate. 
and customize to meet your site's design brand and future brand needs as you go along. Now, if it's time for you to grow up from YouTube, JW Player has you covered. The spectrum goes all the way from casual YouTubers all the way up to large-scale publishers and broadcasters who want to maximize video ad fill rates and CPMs. Now, if you visit the Twit website, you'll notice that that when you catch up, watch an episode on the site, it uses JW Player. Now, as Leo has said, it is one of the most important features of the Twit website with quick access to any show right on the site. It's critical for Twit's business, and JW Player gets out of the way and let's Twit shine. Now, Twit is not the only one who's using this awesome player. Now, top websites and publishers like Washington Post, Business Insider, and Vice all are able to customize the JW player for their needs. And it's able to integrate into their brands and seamlessly integrate into their website design as well. If you're ready to go take control of your video experience, here's what JW player can bring to the table. Buffer-free technology makes it the fastest player on the net. Video CMS to manage your uploads and videos as well. Plus, they offer APIs for you to enhance the experience and integrate it into your site's functionality. Plus, if you're running ads, this player will help you max out your fill rates and CPMs. To me, if you're serious about offering content, JW Player is the way to go. Now, for a limited time, download the free ebook, The Modern Publisher's Guide to Video Advertising. Visit jwplayer.com slash twit and use code twit at checkout and you'll get 50% off your platinum subscription. This is a limited time exclusive offer for twit.tv listeners. So be sure to check it out today. That is jwplayer.com slash twit and use code twit at checkout. And we thank JW Player for their support in this week in enterprise tech. Well, we remember that small Equifax breach that leaked uh, only 143 million Americans data. Well, actually, later on, it re reported actually 148 million. Well, Captain Obvious was blessed us has blessed us with presence this holiday season in the form of a House Oversight Government Reform Committee staff report that claims, and I quote, "It was entirely preventable." Was it? Was it really? Now, do you wonder what data they needed or analyzed to come to this conclusion? Well, good question, because Equifax, in a drive to attain fast growth, acquired companies at the rate that exceeded its ability to securely integrate them. It neglected its IT, resulting in critical vulnerabilities remaining unpatched for 145 days. It did not engage in basic preparation like breach notification procedure. So essentially what they're saying is greed made them skip things. Now on the flip side, Equifax responded saying that they didn't have enough time to respond with their take on the breach or what this report concluded. Uh, why isn't this company bankrupt yet with lawsuits? I don't have any idea why not. Well, the report also does call out some points of failure. For one, the credit agency failed to patch a disclosed vulnerability in Apache Struts, a common open source web server which Homeland Security had issued a warning about months before. Now, the attackers used the vulnerability to pop a web shell on the server weeks later and managed to retain access for more than two months. Now, the House panel also found that they that they were able to pivot through the company's various systems by attaining an, an unencrypted file of passwords on one server, letting the hackers access more than 48 databases containing unencrypted consumer data from credit data. Now, Equifax did not see the data exfiltration because the device used to monitor the network traffic had been inactive for 19 months due to an expired security certificate. Okay, well, let's take a, this. Uh, let's take a look at this here, guys. I want to bring you back in. You know, does this tell us anything else that we don't know, Curtis? What about you? Well, I think the thing that it does is point out that, from executives' point of view, it is cheaper to pay the insurance premiums for cybersecurity incidents than it is to defend against cybersecurity problems. We know that Equifax got a check for eight figures from their insurance company to deal with this. And since there has been no legal repercussion, um, they know that they've done for what for them was the right thing. The only impact to Equifax so far has been in the realm of public relations. And since most of their customers or other companies, they just don't care. So the real question is, what can we do either as government agencies or society to make them care? And for better or for worse, 
the current political climate is such that the answer is going to be nothing. <laughs> right. So, Kurt, Brian, I actually want to throw it over to you. Like, there are there are some laws out there that are attempting to make things better, like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and of course HIPAA. But th does this help at all in in some of these organizations, especially like Aquifax? I don't think so. I I kind of agree with Kurt that there's doesn't seem to be enough ramifications. You know, at first blush, when I saw the rule GDPR rules for Europe. I go, wow, that's trying to kill an ant with a sledgehammer. And then I really started looking at the recent Marriott breach and now more details on the Equifax breach. And it's like, okay, maybe that sledgehammer really is necessary because these guys just aren't listening. And, you know, that insurance check that Equifax got, I seriously doubt they plowed that into security. I'll bet you they use that to pad their bottom line. So I'm pretty disgusted with them. And, you know, I wish there was a way for me as a consumer to go and say, um, I refuse to do business with Equifax. But because it's all mostly business to business, it's like the consumer has no say. Um, so I'm going to give my standard uh, suggestion to our viewers and say, call your Congress critters. Tell them enough is enough. Um, your public trust is being breached by people like Equifax, and there needs to be some real, honest-to-God um, ramifications that are going to hurt these idiots enough that they'll actually do something. Right, right, right. Well, what about that? I think, Brian, you brought up a little bit about GDPR. Curtis, is, would G GDPR actually help in this case as well? Um, because some people don't really understand GDPR. But would this actually help... Uh, if they were to bring this to the United States? Well, GDPR potentially could help because GDPR carries within it the potential for some very serious financial penalties for, for companies that are found to be in breach of privacy regulations. The, the thing is that so far, we don't know whether regulators will actually apply those heavy penalties. That's one of the reasons that around the world, businesses are watching this Marriott Starwood case so carefully because it promises to be the first very large breach that falls under the GDPR regimen. Um, it's going to be fascinating to watch it and see if the regulators have any stomach for serious penalties or if this is yet another case where the potential is there but we decide that those poor, fragile businesses just can't bear the strain of being held accountable for their actions. All right. And you bring up a good point because, it, in fact, there have been um, – here's some interesting facts. There have been some states that have enacted some laws that make it harder, that, that in, infuse some penalties on organizations. For instance, Arizona is cracking down with some state laws, the HB 2154 – they will now penalize poor cyber hygiene and irresponsible data management while bolstering its protections for consumers and adding notification requirements for data breach victims. They also set a hard data breach notification deadline. They established standards to work with law enforcement. They significantly raise the maximum fine for offending businesses, and they widely expand predictions for Arizona uh, residents. And the news law is also standards among the toughest in the nation, and we do see a lot of other organizations also doing this. Kurt, uh, I want to, Brian. I want to throw this over to you. Is this is it time that maybe just states start taking control of this? Well, you know, they're scaring the bejesus out of a whole bunch of really big ISPs with their net neutrality laws. Maybe it's time for states to implement something like GDPR uh, for companies operating within their borders and uh, scare the bejesus out of them again. Um, that seems to be the only way to get them to do anything, and so I encourage my legislature, wield that sledgehammer and make these companies accountable. Right, right, right. So that brings in interesting another thing, because the EFF is also kind of pleading with Congress here as well. What, you know, what are they saying? Well, they're saying, hey, we require opt-in consent to online data gathering. They also want to give users a right to know about data gathering and sharing. They also want to give users right to data portability. 
and they want to impose requirements on companies for when customer data is breached. And they're requiring businesses that collect personal data directly from consumers to serve as information fiduciaries, similar to the duty of care required of personal certified personal accountants. Now, Curtis, I know that the EFF, they're trying to obviously uh, influence and get uh, so Congress to move forward. Are, is this all that we really need here? Is, it, is these things in order to kind of help hold organizations accountable for this type of stuff? Well, the last two things that you mentioned, the uh, way that, that organizations are, are felt to be uh, f- have a fiduciary responsibility if over the data, uh, that has echoes in the language from GDPR. Um, so that's, that's good, but it doesn't really mean anything until there, there are penalties attached or until there is a mechanism for individual users to, to bring suit to enforce penalties. Um, I haven't seen any language like that in what the EFF is, is proposing. Now, as for the first thing, the uh, informed consent and all of that, To be brutally honest, we have that in many instances. It's just buried in two-point type on paragraph 97, subsection E, you know, in the the user agreement. Uh, So from a legal standpoint, many users are already giving consent for their data to be collected and stored. What we have right now is a situation where in many cases, though, there are so many layers of um, a partnership with applications, with services, with uh, advertising networks, with service networks, that the companies that are actually storing the data and analyzing it and making use of it and selling it are five, six, 10, 15 layers removed from the original permission that was given by the consumer. And I think those layers of relationship need to be peeled away from a regulatory standpoint. And each of those organizations needs to be held responsible if there's going to be any accountability at all. So, do, Brian, you brought up – this is an interesting point because Brian actually put in the notes and brought up an interesting point about the fact that maybe it's time for insurance companies and maybe some local courts to start holding companies accountable. Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, the insurance companies are paying out for security breaches, even though Equifax was clearly culpable in this and asleep at the wheel. Well, you know that old story about, you know, it's the laws and everybody that determines what insurance fraud is. Maybe there needs to be some sort of law that says, hey, if you've been totally and completely asleep at the wheel, you did some really stupid things and you caused harm, that the insurance companies should be let off the hook. It sounds nasty, but... That's a heck of a sledgehammer, too. All right. I think that makes sense. I think it makes sense. Um, and it also makes sense that, you know, maybe insurance companies start to impose more regulations on these companies as well. So when the data is breached, they're not going to they're not willing to pay out. They're, they're willing to only pay out if specific requirements are met. Um, and so maybe companies can be hit from that aspect as well. Um Curtis, I want to ask you: Are there other can consumers do anything for themselves here? Can they protect themselves? Uh, you know, can they uh, sue the companies and, and try to in, in hopes that they um, get some uh, some monetary uh, re- uh, response from from companies like this to hold them accountable? Well, to be brutally honest, in a case like this, what you're looking for is going to turn into a class action suit, and at that point, the individual consumer is going to see something that amounts to not very much at all. Um, an individual consumer is unlikely to be able to, to cause great pain to any of these organizations. So what the consumer needs to do is protect themselves from the consequences. Uh, when it comes to the credit card numbers, just depend on the credit card companies to make those good when they are inevitably breached. The biggest thing that consumers can do is use a different password for every site and every service because we know 
that criminals are going in, finding the easily hacked services, scooping up the passwords, and then going out and trying them on other services. So use different passwords, probably need to use a password manager, and just wait for the inevitable notice that your account has been breached. And at that point, allow the folks at the credit card companies to to do that thing they do to uh, take care of the financial fallout. Absolutely. Some good recommendations there for consumers. Well, folks, next up, we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. But first, we get to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Avnet. Now, Avnet brings new meaning to groundbreaking technology. Their goal is to make technology accessible for everyone. Now, with the help of Avnet, Not Impossible Labs had an idea. They wanted to revolutionize live music. Now, live music for people who can hear is an experience like no other because it affects all of our senses. Now, this is where Avnet took on a challenge to make experience like this more accessible to everyone, including the deaf community. Now, how do they do it? You ask, well, with Avnet as their guide, Not Impossible Labs applied their idea to one of the most sophisticated wearables on the market. This system helps bring a shared live concert experience to everyone. Now, they dubbed it Music Not Impossible. The product allows deaf and hearing concert goers alike to literally feel live music through advanced vibration technology. Now, the wearable technology helps the user immerse themselves. Now, all you need to do is wear a vest, which sound sends vibrations through the ankles, wrists, and chest. Um, and the people who can hear receive vibrations through their ears, but attendees who are deaf and wearing these wearables actually receive vibrations throughout their body all along. Now, all allowing many other Tim of them to actually respond to the live music alongside everyone else. Now, for many, this was a life experience for them. It's, it's an innovation that literally opens up a whole new world of music exploration to those who might not hear in the more traditional sense. Now, Avnet and Not Impossible Labs revealed this amazing technology at this music festival called The Life is Beautiful, and it was an instant success. Now, this is just the kind of innovation we come to expect from Avnet. I love hearing about these amazing, inspiring tech coming from sponsors, especially the one coming from Avnet. Such a cool thing. Now, to find out more, visit avnet.com slash music one to see the journey. That's avnet.com slash music one. And we thank Avnet for their support in this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's now my favorite part of the show. We bring a guest into the Detroit Riot to drop some knowledge on us. And today is no exception. We have the Chief Security Officer of Everbridge, Tracy Reinhold. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us. Great. Hey, happy to be here. So, Tracy, you've had quite the journey through tech, especially in security. Um, why don't you give us a little kind of take and, and insights into how you kind of got into tech and some of the things you've done uh, over the last almost 20, over well, plus 20 plus years? Thanks. Well, Lou, I'll tell you that I started with a full head of hair, if that's any indication of how the journey <laughs> has gone. Um, yeah. yeah, so I spent about 22 years in the FBI, uh, which was right. a great ride. Uh, had an opportunity to uh, retire as a deputy for national security uh, for the Bureau in 2012. Uh, from there, went over to Walmart, a uh, Fortune 1 company at the time, uh, and started a global investigations team there. Uh, with offices in Asia, South America, Southwest Asia, um, Africa, UK, uh, and of course the United States uh, to deal with uh, corruption and those sorts of issues. Uh, from there, I was picked up by uh, Fannie Mae in Washington, D.C. as their chief security officer. Uh, and that's really when we started to look at the advantages of technology as it relates to the security field. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have the opportunity to create two new buildings, uh, about a million square foot. So we ended up using a lot of technology to offset our personnel costs uh, and looked at it more towards an eye of uh, creating a, uh, a value center for the organization as opposed to a cost center, uh, which is sort of an anomaly in the corporate security. Uh, and while we were there, or while I was there, uh, we became customers of Everbridge, which is a great company. And uh, in April of this year, I was fortunate enough to uh, come on board with Everbridge as their chief security officer uh, to design their enterprise security strategy, uh, 
as well as to help our customers uh, enhance their own security uh, technology and capabilities in an effort to streamline operations and increase efficiency and effectiveness. Fantastic. So this is interesting that you've kind of moved over to Everbridge because Everbridge is a very unique organization. It's one of those things where there's the systems kind of behind the scenes. No one really sees them, but most likely they've touched almost every American over the years. Can you kind of talk about a little bit about what Everbridge does and um, kind of like what their claim to fame is? Sure. So Everbridge started right after 9-11. Um, in an effort to provide mass notification to folks, uh, it became readily apparent post 9-11 that that was a, a gap uh, that needed to be filled. So Everbridge actually started as a mass notification company, and they maintained that, and it's still one of their core tenants. Um, but most recently, they've expanded to look at the abilities of corporate security to leverage technology and to address critical event management. Um, the, the nice thing about Everbridge is that it, the threat or opportunity is agnostic um, as it relates to whether it's a, a, a man-made disaster, a terrorist attack, an active shooter, a weather event, or a computer disruption, or an IT disruption. Um, all of that is actually used uh, well, we use Everbridge to help to mitigate those risks and vulnerabilities to a company by providing a platform that allows them to actually recover quickly from a disruption and get back to the generation of revenue. That's our corporate side. We also do a public service side. Uh, we're in about 7,500 police departments across the country uh, where we provide them with incident communication capabilities as well. Um, we operate in all verticals. Uh, the, the nice thing about Everbridge is it doesn't matter what your core business is. Every enterprise is susceptible to critical events. And the faster you recover from those critical events, the faster you can get back to generation of revenue and hopefully avoid any reputational impact from the disruption that you've had. So it turns out a lot of organizations out there, they, they tend to have a, a pretty heterogeneous set of data. Does, does this kind of system actually do better when there's more data points kind of coming in. So if you're, let's say, a retailer and you have, you know, networking events, security events, uh, alarms, that kind of thing, the more data points that kind of get flooded into the Everbridge systems, the better in this case? Well, yeah, so the more granular you are in your ability to detect anomalies. Um, so what happens in Everbridge is we'll take feeds from the organization that, that deploys our system and, and it's software as a system right now for the, the critical event management. So we'll tie into their HR system, their traveler system, um, their IT systems, as well as their physical security systems. The more information that you have, the more granular picture you can develop, which allows you to better protect the enterprise as opposed to what you've done in the past. The other benefit of this is that uh, because it is software as a system, the so we look. Let's look first just a second at global security operations centers for major Fortune 50 companies. Um, the back end of that, the infrastructure build on those is ex incredibly expensive, um, and you're sort of limited to your GSOC or global security operations center. Um, the nice thing about this platform is it's mobile and it's scalable. So you, can, if you are the CSO of a large company, you can actually access it from your smartphone, you can from your tablet, from your computer, or in your GSOC. It doesn't matter where you are physically. Uh, and the connectivity is incredible because you get instant feeds from our Global Inform Intelligence Operations Center that notifies you of emerging threats and risks that you can then tailor to your own specific needs from a company perspective. Got it. So the so organizations, they don't actually, in this particular system, they have to provide you with the data. They have to kind of go in and hook up the fact that, hey, when this type of information comes in, we want to be alerted in this way. And then that's where kind of Everbridge takes off. Is that correct? Right. So, so in a nutshell, what happens is if they decide that they want to use this platform, um, then we work through an implementation process, and they decide what they want to put into it. Every company is different. Uh, oil companies are going to be different based on the ge geography that they work in. There's a more 
a significant threat picture in different parts of the world that they want to have Intel feeds into. Um, and then the, the best thing to do is if you were to add in your traveler information and your static and dynamic locations. So the difference is a static location is let's say you're assigned to 123 Main Street and you know that's where you work. Um, but if we can access an IP address or a cell phone information, then we can also track dynamic locations. So if you have an individual that's traveling into a part of the world that is uh, experiencing upheaval, mm -hmm. you can then push this information through the system. It'll tell you we've got five travelers inbound to that area. We have three employees on location there, and we have 1,500 full-time employees in that area. So everybody within that range gets the message that there's a potential disruption to their business. At the end of the day, it helps people avoid uh, – areas of angst and upheaval uh, mm -hmm. that they would otherwise be exposed to if they weren't aware of this issue. Um, right. The other neat thing about this, this technology from an IT alerting perspective, um, the faster you're alerted, the faster you can recover. So if you've got part of our critical event management program, and it's different for every company. So one right. company may be heavy on uh, employee safety because of the nature of the travel associated with that that company. One of them may be IT heavy. So the nice thing about Everbridge is not only is it scalable, it's adjustable to depending on what the company needs, whether you need safety connection for traveling employees and executives, whether you need IT alerting for your network intrusion detection, those sorts of things. So if you look at it this way, there's an intersection between where we have risk events and assets. Assets being, of course, the people, your, your, your employees, your visitors, your guests, etc. cetera. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether it's an internal or external issue. That's the beauty of Everbridge is it's, it's incident agnostic. It doesn't matter. It will help alert you to what you do and what you need to know based on the rules that you put into the system from your own company's perspective. That makes sense. So, so let's talk about, you mentioned a little bit about the scale. So let's talk, kind of get into the technology behind this. But it, so it sounds like, you know, because I've worked on Azure Service Bus before, and that's kind of a way for an organization to build and handle data, queue it, and then send alerts and notifications. And I can tell you that the, the infrastructure behind that is very complicated. It, it, it's complicated. It has, uh, it, it's hard to handle kind of recovery and failover. And so can you kind of give us a little bit of insight into like how Everbridge, because it sounds like they not only have their own infrastructure, but it sounds like they also have, have to handle a lot of different data points coming in from the wild and aggregating those together in order to make sense out of them all and also then kind of notify and, and send out notifications. Right. So right. can you kind of give us a, a so, breakdown of that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, so when you look at it, let's first talk about um, – out of region data centers, which we have, um, our our goal is to have 99.9% .9 uptime. Uh, if our customers count on us and we're unavailable, then it's really not worth it. It's a service not worth buying. Um, so we have out of region data centers that are active active that allow us to maintain viability 24-7. Uh, as far as the intel feeds that we have, we have a global intelligence operations center that calls from 104 different open sources uh, and aggregates data. And then that data is, is deconflicted based on the rules assigned by each customer. So right now we have 4,200 global customers. We have over 500 million people that we serve in those customer bases um, on any given day. So what ends up happening is if I am uh, the Acme Tire Company, for lack of a better example, and I have operations in Chandigarh, India, uh, I, wanna, I want the Intel feeds to tell me about specific disruptions uh, that they can monitor. Now, they don't care about other parts of the world. So what our system does from a, um, an algorithm perspective is it brings in all that data and then deconflicts it based on the rules. The final review of that information is then done by our global intelligence center, which is staffed 24-7 by seasoned analysts. So as, as opposed to just merely relying on the algorithm, we then want to give it a final sc a human scrub at the end of the day. And then it gets sent to the customer so that they have an opportunity to have a plan in place. Some of what the, the benefits of this is, is that the system automates a lot of the responses that companies have traditionally had to handle manually. As an example, if you are 
Well, we'll use Walmart as an example. If you are a Walmart and you are in Bentonville, Arkansas, right in Tornado Alley, do you want to have to manually approve the issuance of a warning in the event of a, of a tornado? Or that's something that can be automated. So it gives you the flexibility of saying these are standard things that we want to automate. So it cuts down our response time. Uh, it also cuts down on the human interaction and the human error factor. Uh, and then there are other things that we may want to to retain that capability ourselves. And the, the GEOC will be notified or the GSOC will be notified and then they'll make the decision. But part of it is building this into templates that are then engineered into the system that allow the system to make the critical calls where the company is comfortable with them being made in that manner. So it gives them both options. Um, and what happens is a company will sit down with a company as we go into deployment We'll go through their whatever their human resources feed is, uh, and we'll pull out what they want. Do they want home addresses mapped? Do they want just physical addresses mapped? Uh, does the company have a cell phone policy where we can capture cell phone information for dynamic locations? All of that gets aggregated on our end. And then when the only thing the customer sees is they'll get an alert and it'll either be an automatic dissemination or they'll have the option to do it manually. So it really simplifies the process, reduces the load on your GSOC, um, and allows them to focus on other things. And it gets rid of most of the white noise. Um, if you've ever been in a global operations center, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of my pet peeves is the fact that there's always a television on that is... Uh, train to the Ellen show, for lack of a better example. <laughs> That's not really giving you the information you need. Um, this system is a single pane of glass, a common operating environment that tells you, gives you all of the alerts and then the alerts that are, well, all the alerts globally at any one time and the alerts that are, are affecting assets in your company. You can then drill into them individually. So, um, so Tracy, this is all interesting stuff. But I think I'm also interested in the feedback loop because a lot of the organizations, they, you know, especially the Walmart example that you gave, where people kind of are in harm's way, and we want to potentially know if the organization members have gotten out of harm's way, if they've gotten the notification. Is there a feedback loop kind of built into the system? There is. That's it, a great point, Lou. Um, so what happens is it's 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 multimodal. Uh, so what will happen is the company will decide how they want it to go out. Maybe it goes out SMS first, text, phone, email. Um, it continues to go through that loop until the, the person that's on the receiving end acknowledges that they have it um, and that everything is fine. You know, and the company can set up whatever they want for it. Press one if you're fine. Press two if you need assistance. Uh, press three if you're out of the region and, this is, and you shouldn't have gotten this, this alert. So in that way, and then that gets, that gets put together and it gives us great feedback as to how effective it is. Um, and, and to be honest with you, we do the same thing at Everbridge. Um, probably once every two months, we'll send out test notices to our own employees who are all over the world uh, to get an idea of whether or not, because we all have the app on our phone as well. Um, that, and that allows us to do a little internal testing. And then what we do from a company perspective is we will sit down with a customer and go through that feedback loop with them if there's any dissatisfaction and try to debug that system for them so that they make sure that it works effectively. Um, one of the other challenges is that some folks uh, simply won't acknowledge. So there's a certain percentage that are always going to do that. Uh, we found that after, so for example, after the Paris attacks, um, that reluctance to respond dropped exponentially. Um, as the world comes a more volatile place, people are less less concerned about the adage that somebody's watching my every move to the fact that, hey, you know what, they're actually looking out for me and this is a good thing for me and for my company. Right, right, right. Well, when we come back, I do want to talk a little bit about security and how Everbridge handles all of this data. But also, I want to bring my co-hosts back in because they're kind of chomping at the bit here in the in the chat. Um, but before we do, we do want to thank a great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that is DigitalOcean. Now, I can tell you, as a developer, um, I I like to experiment a lot, and I like to kind of throw my apps out there and potentially try to use some cloud services to do it. And in a truly hosted environment, it's sometimes hard to do that because it's hard to deploy those services. It's hard to get your data out there. Um, and you don't want to focus. You want to focus more on innovation rather than the logistics behind it. And DigitalOcean kind of removes that impedance of cloud deployments and hosting. They make it easier than ever to deploy your applications and code, store things on the cloud without really worrying about all the steps in between. And I also love the names they, they like to give stuff, starting with DigitalOcean's droplets, which are actually super scalable virtual machines that actually can add on security, storage, and monitoring capabilities 
with just one simple click of a button. They also have a really great one-click deployment model that makes it easy to bootstrap your project, whether it's a specific distribution of Linux, like one-click deploy Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, and more, or you want to one-click deploy an application stack such as Docker, LAMP, MongoDB, Node.js, MySQL, and a ton more. Not only that, it's really easy to deploy and it's easy to manage as well. They, they offer VM snapshots, and I can tell you that's super simple to manage. And for me, it gives me kind of peace of mind to know that that last known good state is only one click away, but plus it offers team management and unified collaboration as well. It helps your teams manage and scale your infrastructure and apps. Now you need more security? Well, they also offer one click cloud firewalls for your droplets and your droplet groups. Now get this, cloud firewalls are free. Now these firewalls are not only just low, they're not only just for low tier systems, but they also let you also handle production ready uh, systems as well. So it lets you scale with your business. Now, to meet the demands of the market, DigitalOcean actually follows that great model of pay for play pricing. So clear and concise, it helps you model out your demands of your applications and your services as they grow. No more complexity of trying to understand your future bills and paying your current one. Now, is your site starting to become more popular and you need to scale? Well, load balances are also available for your system right out of the box. It can be deployed as fast as your droplet can. If you're like me, you like to write scripts, DigitalOcean Austria has you covered. They have an API. It's for fair standard HTTP requests, and they help you deploy, manage, and thousands of droplets um, at a time in a programmatic way. Now, they're, they're all, I've given you a ton of reasons already, but DigitalOcean also has some of that extra stuff that they don't charge you for. 99.99% uptime SLA, cloud firewalls, monitoring and alerting, DNS management, global centers, enterprise SSDs, and easy-to-use APIs. If you ask me, DigitalOcean has you covered. There's really no reason why you shouldn't go out right now. Try DigitalOcean, especially to support here uh, us on Twiat. Go to do.co slash twit. Uh, even if you're thinking about doing a project in the future, you should go out there right now because over 150,000 businesses, including some of the world's fastest growing startups, rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash twit. That's do.co slash twit for a free $100 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support in this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with the chief security officer at Everbridge, Tracy Reinhold. Tracy, this has been some interesting stuff so far because, again, we don't necessarily always see the systems behind all of this alerting, um, especially in disaster times and catastrophic times. One thing I do want to ask you about is a little bit about security. Since you are the CSO, um, well, how, do the, how does the Everbridge handle this data? I mean, obviously, since you do have a global um, uh, security center and then you obviously operation center that you handle out there, you have multiple different regions that you handle in the world. Where, where, how do you guys handle all of this data? Where, where is it, is it, can it be handled from a government cloud perspective? You know, how is it, has it broken up and um, how do you kind of handle that data from as it flows in? So, so as far as uh, customer data, um, it, we, we are a cloud-based service, and, and as I said earlier, we are software as a service. Um, so we maintain that in our secure cloud. Um, we, I, and to be brutally honest with you, there's a separate team that handles network security and data security out in our LA office. Um, so they handle most of that. They are way smarter at that than I'm ever going to be. Um, so I defer that part of the question to them. I apologize. I know that uh, Imad would be able to handle this as our CTO. Um, but from a security perspective, we we look at it as it's our responsibility to maintain the integrity of the data that a, a client gives to us. Um, we have protections in place. We have early detection systems for intrusion that notifies us in, in the event that our system is being attempted to be penetrated. Um, like I said, we have dual operating uh, data centers that we maintain our infrastructure in that protects the integrity of the data that a customer entrusts to us. Um, we, I, I will say that we have not had an issue to date, although that's probably a horrible thing to say in today's society for fear that you know tomorrow will be the day. Um, but we do everything in our power to make sure that the trust that our customers give us is earned and warranted. Right. Makes sense. Well, I do want to bring my co-host back in. Brian, you had some questions about alerting. Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, apparently I've been an Everbridge customer indirectly because I live in Hawaii and 
we uh, got a whole bunch of alerts about the uh, volcanoes that recently went off. But right. Hawaii's most famous alert was the false alarm of a ballistic missile inbound. And so that <laughs> brings up, obviously, there's some sort of API so that there's mechanisms, say, for my civil defense to be able to go and send alerts. So if my civil defense was an Everbridge customer and they sent a false uh, mistake, they sent the inbound ballistic missile alert and it somehow or another managed to pass pass muster and actually went out. How do you guys handle um, when the customer makes mistakes? What kind of mechanisms would you implement with them to handle that kind of thing? Yeah, so when you look at the life cycle of a crisis, uh, the last piece of that circle as it is, it is the assessment. So you want to go back and you want to do a hot wash and you want to figure out what went wrong. And you want to do that by aggregating data across multiple incidents. And you may say, you know, we've had 10 incidences. Um, three of them worked really well. Seven were not. Um, what's the commonality between the three? And how do we put process in place? So one of the challenges, and it's interesting that you bring up the one in Hawaii, um, I will tell you that what we do on the front end of this, before it even gets to you, is that we try to verify the the validity of the, of the information through multiple sources. And then we will send that information out to our customers with varying levels of confidence. So it's sort of like the old intelligence community is uh, the model, what we'll say is we have a high degree of confidence that this has happened, which means that we've been able to validate that information through multiple independent sources that are not linked to each other. Um, it's not just coming off of a one specific data feed or one specific uh, news event. Uh, we've done the work on the front end to make sure that it's actually real and that it's something that you should should be aware of. Now, in the event that a customer sends out something that is, you know, we we have a limited ability to um, direct customers as to how they want to use the system. Um, it's a tool that makes their life exponentially easier, um, but there will always be the human factor in that. Uh, we have training sessions with our customers. We have quarterly meetings with our user groups across the world to give them an opportunity to become better educated about the system, the latest uh, rollouts of what's coming next, those sorts of things, and then to provide them with training as well. Uh, our technology engineers and our senior account managers provide actual training sessions for our customers to make sure that they are very, very comfortable uh, in using the system. And then we have a 24-7 line that they can actually notify through us if they have a question or a concern that they can't find an answer to. So we try really hard to not have those sorts of things happen. Uh, when they do happen, if they do happen, it's our responsibility to work with our customer to make them more effective and more efficient in the utilization of the tool. Okay, one quick follow-up then. So one of the things that my Department of Public Safety has been going around with me are public kiosks. We might be using them for, you know, energy utilization in buildings and things like that. But for the most part, we're using things um, like bright sign, digital, digital signage. If there's an API, what's the process? Is, is there a set of APIs so we can do things beyond just SMS and email? Great question. Um, as the CSO, really not in my lane. I would love to make something up, but that would probably bite me. So I'm going to defer on that one because I, I don't have the answer to that. Um, I'm sure Imad does and our tech folks. But as a CSO, I don't have the API answer for you. Well, I appreciate you know, sharing with us. And, and I just have a couple of questions. You know, I live in Florida. And when you have an event like a hurricane, you often have lots of alerts stacked within that larger event. How is your system on this stacking of alerts? Is that something that is easy for an organization to do? Or does it re require some finesse when it comes to actually using the service? Well, I can give you a real life example. Um, the hurricane we had last year in Florida, um, Everbridge was actually... Um, 
worked with the Department of Public Transportation, the DOT down there, uh, as well as multiple municipalities, even though they weren't customers, as an, as an outreach capacity to help direct evacuation routes. Um, so what we can, what I can tell you is that we did not have an issue with multiple alerts um, in that in that instance. Uh, and Florida is a great example. We also did it in Puerto Rico and in Houston during Harvey. Um, and what we would do is we would work with with a local crisis management team or EOC teams and then ha and provide them with the information that they would need and the format which they could send out an alert. Um, I don't think that we have a challenge with over alerting. I will tell you that when I was with Fannie Mae, that often happens and that's usually an internal company issue in that they have an internal user who serves as an admin uh, and they don't coordinate their responses as they go out. Um, the system itself will tell you how many you've sent, who's responded, and who hasn't responded. Um, and it'll also tell you if you've done duplicate reporting. So I think in that respect, um, part of the onus is also on the end user as to how educated they are on the system uh, and whether or not they understand the capabilities completely. There again, our responsibility to make sure that we have adequate training in place so that folks understand uh, the nuances of using the system, how an alert is generated, and whether it's a one-touch push or whether it's something they want to do in, internally. Uh, one of the benefits I will tell you is that if you set up automatic alerting, it will, it will happen without a human interaction. Um, you want to be sure that you want that to happen. But at the end of the day, that takes out that human error factor on the on the push end from a company or a public safety entity. Okay. Well, I, wa I want to ask one more question on the broad topic, but look at it from a slightly different perspective. Uh, as I said, here in Florida, we are an incredibly spread out state. And a lot of people end up turning off alerts because they're consistently getting alerted on things that are happening 500 miles away. How is your system on allowing users uh, to, to either geofence or fence based on you know, directory identification of users so that you don't end up giving people alert fatigue based on events that, that really don't have any um, impact on, on their work or, or their life? Great question, Curtis. And I'll tell you that um, that's one of the my favorite aspects of this system um, is the is the ability to put a polygon around a specific area and only alert in that area. But now you have to understand that if you are a user and you enter that area, then you will get the alert. Um, so if you're traveling through the area, you'll get the alert or if you're inside that polygon. So that's one of the ways that we do it. And I'll give you a real example. Um, we were able to do that back when I was with Fanny um, during the Houston issue uh, where we were able to geofence or put a polygon around an area and determine potential impact of the storm as it related to unpaid loan balances, which was fantastic for us. It was a great win for us because that allowed us to put together a proactive strategy on loan forbearance and those sorts of things uh, that would have affected those homeowners. So that's the neat thing about this is you can you can use a polygon, you can geofence, you can do either one. If you have a stagnant location uh, like your main office, you can geofence that. That's not an issue at all. Everybody inside that geofence gets to notice. Everybody outside of it doesn't. Same thing with a polygon, depending on the dynamics of the situation, whether it's the Paris riots that are, happened last week. If you want a specific area where a company is focused in Paris, you want to see whether or not there's any uh, demonstration activity inside that polygon that's going to affect those employees. That's a great way to do it. And those that are outside of that polygon won't be notified at all. So there again, the user has the ability to establish that polygon or that geofence that allows them to limit the scope and scale of the messaging that they send. So Tracy, the whole idea about, you know, who alerts and things like that, what about first responders? Say, for instance, we have a five alarm fire and the chief in charge of that fire discovers that there the fire is going to be reaching some gas main. So like the San Bruno fire. Um, is there a way within the system to have a differing levels of trust for inputs? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a good point. So the nixel feeds that we get, which are mostly from law enforcement, um, there's a certain level of trust that we get from those that we don't get from other open source feeds. Um, we want to make sure that if it's coming from a from a first responder community, there's a certain amount of validity that's already assigned to that so that then they will have the ability to push more alerts than others. Um, so, so what I would say, I would go back to what we talked about earlier, and that is verifying um, the veracity of the alert. You want to make sure that it's not a single source. Um, because there's more room for error there. So if we have, if there, if our global information or global intelligence operations center gets 17 different ones uh, on the same incident, then that will be a, assigned a higher level of confidence than we would to one that only has one or two uh, independent verifications. And so I, I'm not sure that's exactly what you're asking. Um, but we can also then tailor messages depending on what's happening. Uh, we can say, so we did a lot with the wildfires in California. Um, we've done, we did a lot with the flooding earlier in the year. Um, and we work with the local municipalities to tailor those messages so that it affects specific parts of the community. Um, we found it to be effective. Um, there's always room for improvement in any alerting system, and we are constantly looking to uh, reevaluate uh, what we do and if, how we can do it even better into the future. Tracy, this has been really fascinating, but we we're, unfortunately we're running out of time. I didn't want to give you a chance um, to tell the folks at home, if they have an organization that wants to kind of get on to something system like that, where do they get started? Where do they, where do they actually go to at least doing some investigations to learn about what they, the system can do for them? Um, how do they get sure. started? How do they get onboarded? So it's fairly simple. Um, they can just go to everbridge.com. There's a complete uh, descriptive analysis done on the site itself, and it talks to you about how it is you can get started in the Everbridge process. Um, chances are that one of your companies that you already do business with is already using Everbridge. It may not be branded as Everbridge uh, because some municipalities in particular prefer to have it from an in-house perspective, but the backbone of that is Everbridge. Um, we, and I hold, uh, just for future reference, I hold CSO roundtables across the country during the year where we bring CSOs together to talk about shared challenges and problems. Um, that's another great format, so watch for that on social media. That gets a uh, advertised on LinkedIn and other sites uh, during the course of the year. But your best bet is to go to everbridge.com and then click on a link for, you know, you want a solution. Uh, you can review the solutions. You can look at the different verticals in which they operate in just to give you some idea as to whether or not that's going to be right for you. Uh, if your company or entity deals with critical event management, which I can't imagine you don't, Everbridge is the game changer for this going forward. Fantastic. Well, we've been talking with Tracy Reinhold, CSO of Everbridge. Tracy, thank you so much for being here on this week in Enterprise Tech. Really some fascinating stuff. Uh, maybe we'll have you back on again. I want, I want to be able to actually hear a little bit about how Everbridge has been handling uh, some of the different uh, events that were happening around the world. And it'd be all, always interesting to see how that has going through. So thank you so much for being here. Great. Thanks, Lou. Thank you again, Tracy, for being here on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best staying enterprise podcast in the universe, according to 9 out of 10 data breach flags. But I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially my co-host in crime, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin. Mr. Curtis Franklin, uh, tell us where you can, everyone can find you and all of your work. Well, as always, you can find me at Dark Reading. Uh, I've got a lot of the end of the year stuff coming up, some fascinating articles and interviews. And to keep up with what I'm publishing over there, just follow me on Twitter at KG4GWA. Fantastic. Thank you, Curtis Stokes. Thank you so much for being here. Of course, we want to thank our producer as well and our co-host, Mr. Brian Chi. Brian, where can they find you and all of your work? Well, as always on Twitter, I'm ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. Uh, or I'm Chebert at twit.tv, but better yet, why don't you use twiet at twit.tv and that'll hit all the hosts. We'd love to hear from you with show ideas. Um, and as for what I'm going to be doing, I'm actually going to be meeting with uh, my new infrastructure director. And we're going to be talking about emergency call boxes and surveillance systems at the University of Hawaii campus. And I'm going to ask him, are we an Everbridge customer? I bet you we are. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys for being here. You definitely make the show great. Well, folks, I also want to thank 
everyone who makes the show possible, especially thank you to you because you drop in each and every week and you're our loyal listeners and viewers. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen this sh- for the show. Uh, go to right now. Go to twit.tv slash twiat. And there you'll find all of the back episodes, all the show notes, all the information about our guests. And of course, right next to those those videos and that information, we also have those really helpful subscribe links and download links. And they help you subscribe to your format of your choice, whether it's the audio version, the video version, the H2 video version, and listen on the device of your choice. So go ahead and do that right now. Go ahead and sign up and subscribe and help support This Week in Enterprise Tech. Of course, if you're going to go ahead and subscribe... You might as well also listen to the show live as well, because every week we do this show live at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. You can check that out at live.twit.tv. Come see the, the show and how it's run and all the behind the scenes as well. If, you, if you're going to jump in live, you might as well jump into the chat room live as well at irc.twit.tv and come out and, and ask some questions and join the great discussions that happen behind the scenes. Also, don't forget, you can follow me at twitter.com slash lumm. Uh, you can see all the things that I do during my normal daily week. Uh, the great thing about right, right now is actually I'm off for the rest of the year, but you can definitely see all my ramblings about all of my uh, frustrations with consumer uh, companies and retailers out there during the holiday season. So come check out my stream of rambles, ramblings and so on uh, out there, as well as you can check out what I do at my at my day job at Microsoft at dev.office.com. We can see all the latest and greatest of how to customize Office and make it more productive for you. I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially thank you to Leo and Lisa who continue to support us each and every week of doing this week in Enterprise Tech. Also, I want to thank all the engineers at Twit, especially our producer, Brian Chi, who who's actually sets up all the guests and, and all the show information. And so thank you to him for doing such a great job throughout the year. Um, also, I want to thank all uh, the TDs, especially our TD for today, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here. Of course, uh, as part of the edition, we have to ask you, uh, what was the uh, major topic of today's show? Uh, it was about um, a, a bridge uh, forever that goes on forever. Oh, so close. It is about bridging, but it's it's about bridging and alerting and notifying and making sure you have that workflow set up. But, but maybe next time, Kevin. Thank you so much. And uh, until next time, I'm Louis Moresca saying, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep twining.